Okay, now we come to the next sutta, 122 Maha Sunyata Sutta, the greater discourse on voidness. Uh, this one is a very important sutta. Mm. That's very important uh, from the Dhamma point of view. Mm. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country at Kapilavatu in Iroda Spa. Mm. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Kapilavatu for arms. When he had wandered for arms in, Kamp- in Kapilavatu and had returned from his arms round, after his meal he went for his for his daytime abiding to the dwelling of Kala Kemaka the Sakyan. Now on that occasion there were many resting places prepared in Kala Kemaka the Sakyan's dwelling. When the Blessed One saw this, he thought, there are many resting places prepared in Kala Kemaka the Sakyan's dwelling. Do many monks live here? Now on that occasion, the Venerable Ananda, along with many monks, was busy making robes at Gata, the Sakyan's dwelling. Then when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from retreat and went to Gata, the Sakyan's dwelling. There he sat down on a seat made ready and asked the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, there are many resting places prepared in Kala Kemaka, the Sakyan's dwelling. Do many monks live there? Venerable Sir, many... Resting places have been prepared in Kala Kemaka, the Sakyan's dwelling. Many monks are living there. This is our time for making robes, Venerable Sir. Stop here for a moment. This time for making robes uh, is the last month of the rain season. I mentioned last night uh, that uh, in India, the rain uh, season uh, is four, four months. Uh. So the first three months, uh, the monks have to... Uh, stay in one place uh, for the rains retreat. Uh. And after the three months, uh, the last month, uh, they are allowed to make robes uh, because uh, the Buddha allowed them uh, only once a year uh, to make robes uh, uh, because the Buddha didn't want them to spend too much time uh, looking for cloth to make robes and all that. Uh. So that one one month they are busy making robes. Uh. This is the time. Uh. And the Buddha said, Ananda, a monk does not shine by delighting in company, by taking delight in company, by devoting himself to delight in company, by delighting in society, by taking delight in society, by rejoicing in society. Indeed, Ananda, it is not possible that a monk who delights in company, takes delight in company, and devotes himself to delight in company, who delights in society, takes delight in society, and rejoices in society, will ever obtain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. But it can be expected that when a monk lives alone, withdrawn from society, he will obtain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. Indeed, Ananda, it is not possible that a monk who delights in company, takes delight in company, and devotes himself to delight in company, who delights in society, takes delight in society, and rejoices in society, will ever enter upon and abide in either the liberation by mind, in either the liberation of mind that is temporary and delectable, or in the liberation of mind, that is perpetual and unshakable. But it can be expected that when a monk lives alone, withdrawn from society, he will enter upon and abide in the liberation of mind that is temporary and delectable, or in the liberation of mind that is perpetual and unshakable. I'll stop here for a moment. So here you can see, when the Buddha found out that there were many monks staying in one dwelling, this Kala Kemaka's dwelling must be a very big kuti, uh, uh, very big building where many monks can stay. So the Buddha was not happy. The Buddha says, uh, uh, if uh, monks delight in company, delight in society, it is not possible uh, to obtain uh, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. This refers to the jhanas. Uh, uh, states of uh, meditative absorption, uh, which are, which are uh, absolutely necessary for enlightenment, uh, the steps to enlightenment. Uh, so, uh, also uh, in the 
paragraph 4, uh, the Buddha says, uh, uh, if a monk delights in company and rejoices in society, uh, he can also cannot uh, obtain uh, the liberation of mind that is temporary and delectable. The liberation of mind that is temporary and delectable uh, probably refers to the jhanas. Uh, and then, or the liberation of mind that is perpetual and unshakable. Uh, this probably refers to the parts and fruits, uh, the Aryan stages, uh, Aryan stages of parts and fruits and fruits, because um, the Aryan stages uh, are perpetual, uh, and you you cannot uh, once you have attained it, uh, you cannot fall out of those states. Uh, so they are perpetual and unshakable. Uh, so the liberation of mind uh, that is temporary uh, are the jhanas, and the liberation of mind that is perpetual uh, are the parts and fruits, uh, the Aryan stages. Uh, so you see here the Buddha. Uh, stresses very much uh, on solitary living uh, for a monk. Uh, because uh, the Buddha says here, uh, it's obvious uh, that only by living alone, uh, a monk uh, can attain uh, the various uh, uh, stages. Uh, although, this, uh, although there are exceptions, uh, but uh, generally, uh, uh, if a monk wants to attain liberation uh, and uh, then uh, it is important uh, to to stay alone, and this is very different uh, from the Mahayana teachings. Uh. In the Mahayana Bodhisattva precepts, uh, it is not allowed uh, for a monk uh, to live alone, especially in the forest. Uh, he has to associate, he has to associate with society, uh. Uh, and then you have sutta, sutras uh, like the Vimalakirti Sutra. Where they say the Bodhisattva Vimalakirti uh, has attained such a high state uh, that he uh, has surpassed the Arahan Sariputta. And he likes to always uh, uh, mix with high society uh, and, and uh, take delight uh, in uh, company and society. Uh. So here you can see from the Buddha Sutta uh, that it is not possible for such a person uh, to even attain any jhana. Uh not to talk about the Aryan stages. Now I come to paragraph 5. I do not see even a single form, single kind of form, Ananda, from the change and alteration of which there would not arise sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair in one who lusts for it and takes delight in it. However, Ananda, there is this abiding discovered by the Tathagata to enter and abide in voidness internally by giving no attention to all signs. If while the Tathagata is abiding thus, he is visited by monks or nuns, by men or women lay followers, by kings or king's ministers, by other sectarians or their disciples, then with the mind leaning to seclusion, tending and inclining to seclusion, withdrawn, delighting in renunciation, and altogether done with things that are the basis for things, he invariably talks to them in a way concerned with dismissing them. Now stop here for a moment. So the Buddha says uh, there is no single form uh, that uh, if we lust for it uh, and take delight in it, uh, that it would not cause uh, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair to arise in us uh, when any change uh, occurs uh, in, in that form. Uh. In other words, uh, if we love any any uh, any any uh, person, uh, uh, we are attached to any person, uh, and when something happens to that person, uh, it is inevitable uh, that uh, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair would arise in us. Uh, so that's why the Buddha says, uh, be very careful. Uh, if you don't want to suffer, don't be too attached. Uh. Then the Buddha says uh, that the, the, the Buddha, he... Uh, uh, enters uh, uh, into this signless concentration of mind, uh, this uh, uh, presumably the uh, uh, state of the cessation of perception and feeling, uh, which the Buddha uh, uh, can easily uh, uh, enter into. Uh, so when he enters that state, uh, the mind uh, inclines to seclusion. Uh, the, the mind tends to withdraw uh, uh, it goes into that state uh, of utter serenity uh, and, uh, and, and great bliss. Uh. So when somebody comes to talk to him, uh, uh, he, he, he will talk in such a way uh, uh, 
so that um, they know uh, that he, he wants to dismiss them. Uh, so they will have to make the, the talk as short as possible. Uh. Mm. And some people, when they come to talk with, with the monk, uh, they like to spend a lot of time talking. Uh, but if the monk is interested in meditation, uh, he doesn't want to talk a lot. Uh, so he wants to dismiss uh, that person. Uh. So whatever monks uh, can attain high states of uh, tranquility, uh, they like to spend a lot of time uh, in those states uh, and they don't like to associate with people a lot. Uh, they tend to be aloof uh, from society. Therefore, Ananda, if a monk should wish, may I enter upon and abide in voidness internally. He should steady his mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness and concentrate it. And how does he steady his mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness and concentrate it? And concentrate it? Here, Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana, and similarly, second jhana, third jhana, and fourth jhana. That is how a monk steadies his mind internally, quiets it, brings it to singleness, and concentrates it. Then he gives attention to voidness internally. While he is giving attention to voidness internally, his mind does not enter into voidness internally or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. And that is so, he understands thus. While I am giving attention to voidness internally, my mind does not enter into voidness internally or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. He gives attention to voidness externally. Uh, he gives attention to voidness internally and externally. He gives attention to imperturbability. While he is giving attention to imperturbability, his mind does not enter into imperturbability or acquire confidence, steadiness and decision. When that is so, he understands thus, while I am giving attention to imperturbability, my mind does not enter into imperturbability or acquire confidence, steadiness and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. Then that monk should steady his mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness and concentrate it on that same sign of concentration as before. Then he gives attention to voidness internally. While he's giving attention to voidness internally, his mind enters into voidness internally and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision. When that is so, he understands thus. While I'm giving attention to voidness internally, my mind enters into voidness internally and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. He gives attention to voidness externally. He gives attention to voidness internally and externally. He gives attention to imperturbability. While he's giving attention to imperturbability, his mind enters into imperturbability and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision. When that is so, he understands thus. While I am giving attention to imperturbability, my mind enters into imperturbability and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. Uh, stop it for a moment. Huh? Mm. So here, uh, the Buddha says, huh, uh, for a monk huh, to enter, uh, for, for a monk to steady his mind internally, like quiet it and bring it to singleness and concentrate it, he has to attain the four jhanas. And to attain the four jhanas, different monks will have different objects of meditation. What the Buddha uses is anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath. And the Buddha says, if a monk tries to attain to give attention to voidness internally, uh, but his mind does not enter into that voidness internally. Eh? Uh, and then he should try to contemplate on voidness externally. Eh? Uh, and if, if that is not successful, eh? then he should try both internally and externally. Eh? And then after that, I try imperturbability. Eh? This imperturbability refers to the fourth jhana and above, eh? the state. Eh? of uh, tranquility, uh, which is such a high state. Uh. Then the Buddha says, if he cannot do that, uh, then he must go back to entering the, the jhanas, uh, the four jhanas, uh, and uh, attain up to the fourth jhana. Then after he has attained the fourth jhana, the mind becomes very tranquil. Uh, and then at that point, uh, then having come out of the fourth jhana, uh, then he should uh, 
give attention to voidness internally, la, then he sh should be able to enter into it. La, uh, and also all the others, la, externally, internally and externally, and the sign of imperturbability. La, uh, and, uh, this giving attention to voidness internally uh, is mentioned in paragraph 6. La, um, that means by giving no attention to all signs. La, not giving attention to any sign, uh, just to enter into his mind. Uh, okay, now we come to paragraph 11. Uh, when a monk abides thus, if his mind inclines to walking, he walks thinking, while I am walking thus, no evil, unwholesome states of covetousness and grief will beset me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. And when a monk abides thus, if his mind inclines to standing, he stands. If his mind inclines to sitting, he sits. If his mind inclines to lying down, he lies down, thinking, while I am lying down, thus no evil unwholesome states will beset me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. When a monk abides thus, if his mind inclines to talking, i stop here for a moment. So here, uh, if this monk uh, can uh, give attention uh, uh, after attaining the four jhanas, uh, if he can... Uh, give attention uh, to the voidness internally, externally, and imperturbability, uh, and enter into it. Uh, and then, uh, uh, when he comes out of it, uh, if, if he's walking or standing or sitting or lying down, uh, then uh, he says, Buddha says, uh, no evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief will beset me. Uh. This uh, covetousness and grief uh, arises uh, from Craving for sensual objects, uh, yeah. uh, craving for sensual objects, uh, then you have covetousness arising. Uh, if you are still uh, caught up uh, with sensual desire, uh, then uh, you have covetousness. Uh, uh, but if you cannot get what you want, uh, then grief will arise. Uh, uh, so covetousness and grief uh, comes from um, sensual desire, uh, desire for sense objects. Uh, Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thoughts. Uh, so he has, he has attained those states, uh, those high states, uh, where he can enter into voidness uh, or imperturbability. Uh, then this um, covetousness and grief uh, will not beset him. Uh, he's no more interested uh, in sense objects. Uh. When a monk abides thus, if his mind inclines to talking, he resolves such talk as is low vulgar, coarse, ignoble, unbeneficial, and which, not, and which does not lead to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. That is, talk of kings, robbers, ministers, armies, dangers, battles, food, drink, clothing, beds, garlands, perfumes, relatives, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, countries, women, heroes, streets, wells, the dead, trivialities, the origin of the world, the origin of the sea, whether things are so or are not so, such talk I shall not utter. In this way he has full awareness of that. But he resolves, such talk as deals with effacement, as favors the mind's release, and which leads to complete disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana, that is, talk on wanting little, on contentment. Wanting little is also translated as few ones, on contentment, seclusion, aloofness from society, arousing energy, virtue or moral conduct, uh, concentration, wisdom, deliverance or liberation, uh, knowledge and vision of deliverance. Such talk I shall utter. In this way, he has full awareness of that. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, uh, the, the Buddha says, uh, if the monk abides in these uh, states of, uh, uh, these deep states of uh, tranquility, uh, then uh, he will not uh, engage in base talk. Uh. This, uh, this such talk as is low uh, is uh, tirachana kata, uh, literally translated as animal talk, uh, worldly talk. Uh, uh, but he will only talk uh, uh, what concerns the Dhamma. Uh. When a monk abides thus, if his mind inclines to thinking, he resolves such Thoughts as are low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, unbeneficial, and which does not 
and which do not lead to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. That is, thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. Such thoughts I shall not think. In this way he has full awareness of that. But he resolves, such thoughts as are noble and emancipating, and lead the one who practices in accordance with them to the complete destruction of suffering. That is, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. Such thoughts I shall think. In this way he has full awareness of that. I'll stop it for a moment. So here also uh, the Buddha says uh, that this monk, uh, uh, he will be aware of his thoughts. Uh, he will only think right thoughts, uh, not wrong thoughts. Uh. Ananda, there are these five thoughts of sensual pleasure. What five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body, that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five causes of sensual pleasure. Herein a monk could, should constantly review his own mind thus. Does any mental excitement concerning these five causes of sensual pleasure ever arise in me on any occasion? If on reviewing his mind, the monk understands, mental excitement concerning these five causes of sensual pleasure does arise in me on certain occasions, then he understands, desire and lust for the five causes of sensual pleasure are unabandoned in me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. But if on reviewing his mind, the monk understands, no mental excitement concerning these five causes of sensual pleasure arises in me on any occasion. Then he understands, desire and lust for the five causes of sensual pleasure are abandoned in me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha says, a monk should, should, should examine his own mind and see whether he has any desire and lust for uh, sight, sound, smell, taste and touch. Uh, um, Unless a monk uh, uh, has attained jhana and constantly abides in jhana, otherwise uh, he would still have this uh, desire and lust uh, for the five causes of sensual pleasure. So not simply any monk uh, can, can get rid of desire and lust uh, for the five causes of sensual pleasure. Only the monk uh, who... Uh, constantly abides in jhana, in which, in which case uh, he will be not interested to see, to hear and all that. Uh, he's not interested. He won't direct his senses uh, to the sense objects. Uh, he will abide uh, internally uh, most of the time. Ananda, there are these five aggregates affected by clinging, in regard to which a monk should abide contemplating rise and fall thus, such is material form or body, such is arising, such is disappearance, such such is feeling, such is arising, such is disappearance, such is perception, such is arising, such is disappearance, such is volition, such is arising, such is disappearance, such is consciousness, such is arising, such is disappearance. When he abides contemplating rise and fall in these five aggregates of attachment, the conceit I am based on these five aggregates effect, uh, of, of attachment are abandoned in him. When that is so, the monk understands the conceit I am based on these five aggregates of attachment is abandoned in me. In that way, he has full awareness of that. These states have an entirely wholesome basis. They are noble, noble supramundane, and inaccessible to the evil one. Uh, so here, the Buddha says, uh, to get rid of the conceit, uh, I am, uh, which is very difficult to do, uh, that only the Arahan uh, can get rid of the conceit, I am. The Buddha says, uh, we should constantly uh, contemplate uh, the five aggregates of attachment uh, which we take to be I or mine uh, or I am in the five aggregates or the five aggregates are in me. Uh, so uh, constantly uh, we should see uh, the impermanence uh, of the body, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness uh, or body and mind. What do you think, Ananda? What good does a disciple see that he should seek the teacher's company even if he is told to go away? Remember, sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One. 
have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the monks will remember it. Ananda, a disciple should not seek the teacher's company for the sake of discourses, stanzas and expositions. Why is that? For a long time, Ananda, you have learned the teachings, remembered them, recited them verbally, examined them with the mind, and penetrated them well by view. But such talk as deals with effacement, as favors the mind's release, and which leads to complete disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, and enlightenment, and nibbana, that is, talk on wanting little on contentment, seclusion, aloofness from society, arousing energy, virtue, concentration, wisdom, liberation, knowledge and vision of liberation. For the sake of such talk, a disciple should seek the, com the teacher's company even if he is told to go away. i stop here for a moment. So at this point of time, I think the Buddha had already taught a lot of suttas uh, to the monks. Uh, and the Buddha says they are already very familiar with the with, with the with the teachings uh, that is the suttas uh, they have recited them verbally, uh, examined them uh, and understood them. Uh, uh. But the Buddha says uh, that talk uh, which is uh, concerning few having few ones uh, on contentment, uh, seclusion, uh, aloofness from society, uh, arousing energetic effort. Uh, Moral conduct, concentration, wisdom, liberation, knowledge and vision of liberation. For such talk, a disciple should, should seek advice from the teacher, even if he is told to go away. So these, these topics of talk are very important. Since this is so, Ananda, a teacher's undoing may come about, a pupil's undoing may come about, and the undoing of one who lives the holy life may come about. And how does a teacher's undoing come about? Here, some teacher resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. While he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. And as a result, he goes astray, becomes filled with desire, succumbs to craving, and reverts to luxury. This teacher is said to be undone by the teacher's undoing. He has been struck down by evil, unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. That is how the teacher's undoing comes about. And how does a pupil's undoing come about? A pupil of that teacher, emulating the teacher's seclusion, resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, ravine, hillside cave, etc. While he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. And as a result, he goes astray, becomes filled with desire, succumbs to craving, and reverts to luxury. This pupil is said to be undone by the pupil's undoing. He has been struck down by evil and wholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. This is how the pupil's undoing comes about. Stop here for a moment. Here the Buddha is talking about a teacher and the pupil who goes to a secluded place to practice. But maybe because they become famous and a lot of people come to visit them and bring offerings and all that. So they get a lot of offerings, they get uh, become famous. And then uh, they go astray. It's very easy to go astray, especially when a monk becomes famous. So this is said uh, to be the uh, teacher's undoing uh, and a pupil's undoing. Uh. This too uh, refers to external ascetics, uh, uh, not to the Buddha's uh, disciples. Uh. And uh, this, um, as a result of this, uh, they will, uh, they will uh, continue on the round of samsara, the round of rebirths, uh, uh, and also they will suffer. Uh, uh, 
having been uh, overcome uh, by name and fame and uh, offerings and all that. Uh, and how does the undoing of one who lives the holy life come about? Here, Tathagata appears in the world. Arahan, Samasam Buddha, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, etc. But he lives thus withdrawn. Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. Yet he does not go astray or become filled with desire, succumb to craving and revert to luxury. But a disciple of this teacher, emulating his teacher's seclusion, resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, etc., etc., while he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him, and as a result he goes astray, becomes filled with desire, succumbs to craving, and reverts to luxury. This one who lives the holy life is said to be undone by the undoing of one who lives the holy life. He has been struck down by evil and wholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. Thus there comes to be the undoing of one who leads the holy life. And here in Ananda, the undoing of one who leads the holy life has a more painful result, a more bitter result than the teacher's undoing, or the pupil's undoing, and even and it even leads to perdition. Uh, stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha is talking about a Buddhist monk, uh, a disciple of the, the Buddha, the Tathagata, the mm. And here he is said to be the one who leads the holy life. Whereas the earlier, earlier when we, when the Buddha talked about the teacher and the pupil, he does not say that they lead the holy life because the real holy life is the path taught by the Buddha, the path that leads out of the round of rebirths. That's why the real holy life is to be found in the Noble Eightfold Path. And the Buddha says, uh, one who has already come to the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, if you go astray, uh, and then the result uh, is much more bitter than an external sect ascetic. Uh, it can even lead to hell, uh, because the, 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 the teaching is so good, our teacher is so good, uh, the Buddha. And uh, so when we inherit something that is so good, uh, and we go the wrong way, uh, then uh, we have to pay much more than uh, somebody who follows an external sect teacher. Therefore, Ananda, behave towards me with friendliness, not with hostility. That will lead... Sorry, uh, stop you for a moment. So this one uh, set me a thinking. Uh, it's not only for monks, you know, even for lay people. Lay people, you have come to the Buddha's teachings, uh, which is so perfect, uh, utterly pure. You don't make use of it. Uh, when you pass away, uh, you're going to regret uh, very much. Uh, you, you're going to realize uh, such a valuable thing has come into your hands uh, and you just threw it away. And you will have, you, you will have uh, much more remorse uh, than if you, you, for example, if you followed an external sect uh, teaching uh, and the, the, the teaching is not, not worth much. Uh, you, if you threw it away... Uh, you don't regret very much. But you have come into such a perfect teaching as the Buddha's Dhamma and you don't make use of it. That is amounts to throwing it away. So when you, at the end of your life, you will regret extreme, uh, terribly, not only for a monk, also for lay people. Therefore, Ananda, behave towards me with friendliness, not with hostility. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. And how do disciples behave towards the teacher with hostility, not with friendliness? Here, Ananda, compassionate and seeking their welfare, the teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your welfare. This is for your happiness. His disciples do not want to hear or give ear or exert their minds to understand. They err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation or teaching. Thus, do disciples behave towards the teacher with hostility, not with friendliness? And how do disciples behave towards the teacher with friendliness, not with hostility? 
here Ananda, compassionate and seeking their welfare. The teacher, that means the Buddha, teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your welfare. This is for your happiness. His disciples want to hear and give ear and exert their minds to understand. They do not err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. Thus do disciples behave towards the teacher with friendliness, not with hostility. Therefore, Ananda, behave towards me with friendliness, not with hostility. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. I shall not treat you as the potter treats the raw damp clay. Repeatedly restraining you, I shall speak to you, Ananda. Repeatedly admonishing you, I shall speak to you, Ananda. The sound call will stand the test. That is what the Blessed One said. Remember, Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, this part, last part, now I like to elaborate a bit. Now. Here the Buddha says uh, that we should behave uh, with friendliness uh, towards the Buddha. Uh, that is by uh, uh, hearing what the Buddha says uh, in his discourses. Uh, and and uh, give ear and exert the mind to understand what the Buddha is trying to teach us. Uh, uh, and if we don't pay attention to the Buddha's teachings uh, and try to understand, uh, then we are behaving with hostility towards the Buddha's, uh, towards the Buddha. Actually, uh, many people have come to the Dhamma and they don't study the Buddha's words uh, well enough. Uh, they don't know uh, that there are certain suttas, uh, like in the Niga Nikaya, Sutta 29, uh, where the Buddha says uh, that his teachings, uh, his suttas, uh, are complete uh, and perfect uh, and utterly pure. Uh. There is no other teaching uh, so perfect, uh, so pure as the Buddha's teachings. Uh, uh. And the Buddha says, uh, if you want to add to his teachings, you don't understand his Dhamma. If you want to subtract from his teachings also, you don't understand his Dhamma. In other words, uh, we should stay only to the original discourses of the Buddha found in the four Nikayas uh, and six books of the Kudaka Nikaya, the fifth Nikaya, uh, the original teachings of the Buddha. Uh. Unfortunately, nowadays uh, there are additional teachings uh, to be found uh, which are not the Buddha's words. Uh. We know, uh, for example, the Abhidhamma, the commentaries, later books like the Visuddhi Maga, later uh, sutras like the Mahayana sutras and all this. Uh. And the Buddha has warned uh, in the Sangyutta Nikaya 20.7 that uh, uh, in time to come, uh, uh, the Disciples, that means the Buddhist monks, uh, will not want to listen to the Buddha's words. Instead, uh, they want to listen to the words of disciples. The word of the disciples uh, refers to uh, later monks, uh, later monks who wrote the Abhidhamma, later monks who wrote the commentaries, later monks who wrote the Visuddhi Maga, who wrote the Mahayana Sutras and all that. Uh, uh. So the Buddha has already warned us uh, not to listen to those teachings, uh, but to only keep to his original suttas. Uh. So if we don't want to investigate the Buddha's original suttas and understand them, uh, then we are behaving with hostility uh, towards the Buddha. Uh, so it's very important uh, to study suttas like this uh, and to uh, behave towards the Buddha with friendliness uh, by uh, investigating uh, his original suttas uh, and trying to understand his original suttas uh, and not later writings uh, of other monks. Uh. So this sutta is quite a very, this is a very important sutta, uh, Maha Sunyata Sutta, greater discourse on voidness. Uh, uh, to recap, uh, the first part, uh, the Buddha says, uh, a monk does not delight so, sorry, a monk does not shine by delighting in company, uh, by delighting in society. Uh, so the Buddha uh, obviously uh, uh, encourages monks to live alone because the Buddha says only by living alone uh, a monk can attain the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment, uh, namely the jhanas. Uh, and also... Uh, uh, one who takes delight in company and in society uh, will never be able to obtain uh, liberation of mind uh, that is temporary, uh, that is the jhanas. 
all liberation of mind that is perpetual and unshakable, uh, the, the various Aryan stages, uh, the parts and the fruits. Uh, uh, so, uh, it is obvious from here uh, that uh, solitary living uh, for a monk uh, is, 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 is very important. If he wants to get out of samsara, uh, uh, then uh, the Buddha says uh, that uh, if he inclines his mind towards uh, this, uh, the signless concentration of mind, voidness, uh, then if people come to talk with him, uh, he invariably uh, uh, talks in such a way as to dismiss them. Uh, so, uh, it doesn't encourage too much talking. Uh, and then, the Buddha says, uh, a monk uh, should engage in talk uh, that only deals with effacement, uh, talk on one thing little, on contentment, seclusion, aloofness from society, rousing energy, virtue, concentration, wisdom, liberation, knowledge and vision of liberation, yeah. and not to en engage in worldly talk. Huh? And then the, the Buddha also said huh, to constantly review the mind, whether the mind is excited huh, by, by the five chords of sensual pleasure, huh? and if the mind is excited by five chords of sensual pleasure, then it should make more effort uh, to attain the bliss uh, of seclusion, the bliss of renunciation, uh, so that he goes into his mind rather than outwards into the worldly pleasures. Uh, uh. And also the Buddha says uh, to abandon the conceit I am, uh, it's very important uh, to see impermanence uh, in the five aggregates. Uh, uh, which are also the body and the mind, uh, constantly to see uh, the impermanence uh, in the body and the mind, uh, and slowly uh, we will cut the conceit, I am. Uh, and then the Buddha also warns uh, that once a monk has come into the Dhamma, uh, and if he goes astray, uh, it's uh, very dangerous uh, for a monk who, who wears the robe uh, to go astray. Uh, uh, it can even lead him to hell. Uh, and then lastly, the Buddha says uh, that we should behave with friendliness to the Buddha by uh, trying to, uh, to to understand his words uh, in the original teachings. Uh, uh, and then the Buddha says uh, that, uh, Ananda, I shall not treat you as the potter treats the raw damp clay. Uh, in other words, uh, I, I, I won't treat you as something very delicate. Uh, the Buddha says uh, he constantly admonishes his disciples. Uh, the sound core uh, will stand. Uh, so, actually a lot of people don't know the Dhamma. They think uh, uh, showing compassion means uh, to be uh, very, to speak uh, kind words to the disciple all the time. You find this is not what happens with the Buddha. The Buddha sometimes, uh, when the disciples do something wrong, uh, he will scold them, uh, he call them foolish men. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that's the way that the Buddha says uh, that uh, uh, actually that is uh, compassion, that's a real compassion. And a disciple needs to be to be scolded. Uh, the teacher should scold the disciple so that he will wake up. Otherwise, he won't wake up. Mm. Okay. Anything to discuss? No, 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 no. What, what he means is those, um, uh, those, um, those genuine disciples uh, will withstand all that scolding. Those genuine monks, uh, because sometimes the Buddha talks about genuine monks uh, uh, and fraud monks. Uh. Uh, 
Because uh, there are a lot of monks who like to be popular, so sometimes they know what is the real Dhamma, what is not the real Dhamma, but they dare not speak out because they want to have a lot of disciples, they want to have a lot of supporters, they want to be popular, they want to be famous, so they dare not speak out. Uh, so uh, they tend to speak words uh, which people like to listen. Uh, sometimes they even say that their disciples have attained various stages uh, of attainment and all these things. Uh, but uh, that is not the Buddha's way. Uh, the Buddha, in the suttas you find the Buddha says, uh, uh, if it is white, we, we should say it is white. If it is black, we should say it is black. Uh, we should speak the truth. Uh, with no fear or favor. But how can he say that the um, uh, liberation by wisdom is four jhanas? Eh? What is his basis for saying that? Because we find in the, for example, uh, Verbal Sariputta is uh, supposed to be liberated by wisdom. That is what the commentaries say. And in the Anupada Sutta, we found that Verbal Sariputta has attained all the four Rupa jhanas, all the four Arupas, and plus cessation of perception and feeling. So he's still uh, liberated by wisdom. So what he says, there's no basis. In case any one of you is interested, uh, I've written about this liberation by mind and liberation by wisdom in uh, my book, Samatha and Vipassana. Yeah, but the, uh, that opinion, I think, uh, uh, even is uh, a lot of the Mahayanis won't support that. Isn't it? Okay, shall we end here?